Okay, it is Wednesday afternoon, September, oh goodness, I didn't look, 28th, 29th? 29th. 29th. Sorry, folks, I should have known. It is Wednesday, September 29th. We are in our afternoon <coughs> Bible class. We are picking up at what I believe will be at the finality of our study in Romans 9, 10, and 11, Israel past, Israel present, and Israel future. And since we've been so far removed from the past, I think we'll leave it in the past just to say that God has his hand on Israel and that the God of Israel of the past we saw as a God of Israel in the present and we will see he is the God of Israel in the future. And that God is the one who is faithful and he is uh, faithful to all his promises. I just happened that to light, I knew I was forgetting something, but since it came up in one of the classes, I think I'll answer it now just before we start Romans 9, 10, and 11. About three weeks ago, we were asked about the day of the Lord. Does it end at millennium? Or does it end at great white throne? Where does it end? And I said, that was a very good question. So in my hunting, in my researching, um, looking at those who have given reason why they believe, searching the scriptures for the answer, because really that's what we want is what God says, I've come up with a definitive answer of, hmm. <laughs> I'm going to say I lean toward the fact that it, I'm going to say it goes to the great white throne. This is my reason for saying that, and I think this is kind of a change from the way my mind has thought, you know, before. I think before I kind of just in my mind, the day of the Lord went through the, the tribulation and into the millennium, the, the setup of the millennium, which would include the millennium. But as was said, the day of the Lord really is all about judgment on sin. <clears throat> Is God's wrath being poured out on, on the sin? Is God dealing himself directly with the issue of human sin? And if we look at it from that perspective, if that's the definition we give of the day of the Lord, then I have to carry that to the great white throne judgment because that is the ultimate finality of his wrath being poured out on the sin that has has uh, the, the sin of omission, I'll call it the sin of not receiving Yeshua Jesus as Savior. And we know that that's the, the finality for the humans that have lived since Adam's day all the way to whenever we finally get to that day in the future, that it's the great white throne is for all of the unsaved to stand before God and receive their judgment for all of eternity. So that absolutely is a judgment on their sin we are not judged for our sin because we have been forgiven of our sin. Our sin's been washed away. That's why we do not stand before the Lord at great white throne. Hallelujah. I am so forever thankful. But uh, knowing we are not standing there to be judged and knowing they are in relation to their sin, that makes me say, okay, then I believe we could give that umbrella title of the day of the Lord starting with the, the, the tribulation days and moving forward all the way to the great white throne. And when I say starting with, I'm talking about the beginning of the tribulation. Yes, there's even more of the wrath poured out mid, but the whole <clears throat> tribulation period is God's judgment on the entire earth. We just got a taste of what that might in a small way be like with a pandemic that's worldwide that's still affecting the world. The first time I think that we can look at something and say, wow, this is something that's affecting the entire world. I think the Lord is giving a wake-up call to this world saying, you know, this is what we've been foretelling that's coming. You know, years ago people would have said something in, in you know, China wouldn't affect us, but look at the degree it has affected us. And then, you know, what happens here is affecting somewhere else. And with all of the interrelating of the nations going on, we do see the potential for world activity. And we see the thrust, oh my goodness, that has come out of the pandemic for a one world system, a one world thought, one world group think, one world leader leading to one world religion. You can see all the tenets of this in, in the last, I'm going to say two years especially. So we know it's coming. But that's what separates the tribulation 
from other trials, from other tribulations. The Holocaust, a horrible tribulation, but it was not worldwide. It was in a specific area. So there's your difference. And long answer to, I, I believe and I'm going to say the day of the Lord starts with the tribulation, God's wrath dealing with sin worldwide and carried all the way through to the final judgment when sin individually will be judged for the, I'm going to just say the degree of suffering in eternity because I don't know any other way to put it, but we know God's going to balance it where someone who was a horror is going to suffer a consequence equal to his activities versus a sweet little person who isn't so sweet and rejecting the Lord but wasn't a terror on wheels, so to speak. Yes, Dora? I thought the day of the Lord had started when Christ was crucified. No. Um, I'm trying to think why I could have led you to think that, what I could have said, but I, I'm not going to say that it starts there. Um, that's his judgment on sin, um, his shed blood, which you either look forward or you look back. So it's a pivotal date, but I'm going to separate it because day of the Lord really is about judgment. When we read the description day of the Lord, Joel and the other prophets, it's the darkness, it's the sun turning black, it's the moon turning to blood, it's the stars falling, you know, the signs in the heavens and the illnesses on the, the earth. So I'm going to say that's not in conjunction with crucifixion. Well, maybe I'm confused because it's, it's always before Christ B.C. and then it's A.D. So. Okay, and that could be what, what did get you that confusion. If you didn't hear her, she said she does, you know, think about the crucifixion in relation to B.C. and A.D. Again, that's a pivotal point in history when even those who do not want to acknowledge that Yeshua Jesus was a human who walked on the face of this earth who declared that he was God and we know he was yes the calendar changes with the approximation of his birth but again that's a pivotal point in history the date of the crucifixion was a pivotal point in Daniel's prophecy but it's not given a title that goes with the day of the Lord because that again is God's judgment being poured out on sin where the crucifixion spares us from that judgment, from a judgment in time. Okay? Everybody with me? Okay. All right. Okay. And if Roger got anything any better because he ran over to share something good with uh, Dora, he can share it with the class too. Oh. oh, he's giving it to me. Day of the Lord, a biblical term and theme used in both the Hebrew Bible and the New Covenant, New Testament, as in the sun shall be turned into darkness, the moon of blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord comes. Yoel, Joel 2.31, also quoted in Acts 2.20. And the I bottom think, one too. I think I said it, and the bottom one too. The day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, yes, in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. And obviously that's not a 24-hour period. The earth and the, the burning up and all of that doesn't happen at the start of the tribulation. We know that that's, you know, down the road in that. But both good descriptions. And when it says that it comes as a thief in the night, remember in... in I want to say 2 Thessalonians, it has to be 2 Thessalonians, where um, Shaul Paul says to us clearly, we are not of the night, we are the children of the day. And that's a huge thing to keep when you're looking at Thessalonians, when you're looking at scriptures that confuse people and make them think they're going through the tribulation, they need to remember that, that we are not of the night, we are of the day. We are not citizens of the earth, the tribulation, Revelation 3.10, is on earth dwellers. We are heaven dwellers. We are not in our home right now. We are traveling through. Uh, it used to be a, a music group when we were in high school, passing through. <laughs> Just passing through. I hear somebody on the iPhone. Go ahead and, and talk. Go ahead, whoever popped in just now. I think you have a question. Yes, I'm talking. This is Ruth. Okay, I saw you come and go, so um, Roger, can you help her? You might have to go out and come back in again. Okay, you might try that, Ruth. 
go out and come back in. And then it, it... Oh, her camera's turned off. Oh, your camera is turned off. See it? No. Oh. What am I going to say? Right up there. Oh, over there? Yeah. Okay. If you can find your button for your camera or a slide that goes over where the, the view is or something. It should say uh, start video or stop video. Click on that one. And like there should be a red X through it. Okay, we'll give her a minute and that'll give us a chance to reshift back into Romans 11. But that is where I do want to pick up. But this was important too because it came up in this study somewhere, the question did, a couple weeks back. Yes, Rhonda. Okay, right in the first and 3.10 where it says earth dwellers. How are we to know that does it actually mean like people that are living on earth? It, it is meaning the people who are living on earth, but it's not meaning every person. Well, it is meaning every person. Pardon me. Let me get my head on here straight. It is meaning that it's on the people that are dwelling on the earth. How do we know that we're not among them is because when it's talking about earth dwellers, it's talking about the people who belong to the earth. They belong to the earth because they don't belong to heaven. How do we belong to heaven? When we put our faith in Yeshua Jesus, we became a citizen of heaven. We're in a, 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 we could say we're like an ambassador right now for the Lord, that we're on assignment. We've been sent to tell people about our homeland, but our home our place of dwelling, Revelation 21, when we're d dwelling with God forever, is not earth. Our headquarters, our home is heaven. We will be in the New Jerusalem. We will be in God's heaven. So we are heaven dwellers. People that are on earth are earth dwellers. They're the ones that they belong to this earth and that's all they belong to because they've never put citizenship somewhere else and the only way you can get that citizenship is being adopted into the family of God the only way you get adopted into his family to become a, a joint heir with Messiah Yeshua Jesus is through believing he is Messiah and Savior and having his blood shed in our place so which I think you all do know and understand so that's how we know that we're not earth dwellers um, that we are um, citizens of heaven 1 Corinthians 5, I want to say about 17, talks about our citizenship in heaven. If I've got it backwards, 2 Corinthians 5 talks about the new life in Christ. We, you know, the old, old's passed away, we're all become new. One's in first and one's in second. So if you don't find what you want in the first book of Corinthians, try the second book. Um, and if, if I'm still wrong, I'll, I'll bring you the correction next week, but I believe I'm remembering the scripture um, quite accurately, somewhere right around there. Did you say Corinthians? Yes. Okay. Yeah. I believe it's 1 Corinthians 5 that talks about ambassadors uh, um, for the Lord, and 2 Corinthians 5 says that we're a new creation. But like I said, I may have it backwards, but I think I'm right. Somebody can look it up fast even and let us know. Um, Ruth is still having trouble, but I think we're going to have to go ahead and go in because I want to finish Revelation 11. So, Ruth, are you still where you can hear? Okay, she's probably trying to come back in. Can I have you follow through with her, Roger? Okay. All right, then. My apologies to her, um, but it, it'll be just that quick review. Hopefully, she'll get in in time anyway. And, and uh Worst case scenario, she just doesn't have to look at my face. I don't think that would be so bad. <laughs> okay. Um, Romans 11, Romans 10, we know the present. Uh, we see Israel as a rebellious people, that as a whole, she is not in right relationship with her God. But we have seen very clearly um, from Shaul Paul setting up the, the questions, does that mean God's through with Israel? No. You know, is he through with Israel because she rejected the Messiah when he walked on this earth first century AD? No. Is he through with Israel because she's a rebellious people? No. It's, it's clear. God forbid, don't even think it. Anathema, may it never be. Far from you. Instead, God is going to continue to work with Israel. He is the faithful one, faithful to his promises, and he is going to child train her because that's what you do with a rebellious child. And he will draw her back, and we will see the, the fulfillment of all those uh, promises given to her 
as God knew he would do one day when things have been righted, R-I-G-H-T-E-D. Um, but we'd see the time in between is not wasted. It's part of God's perfect plan also. And I want to clearly say, even though I've said it many a time before, this is not plan B. This didn't catch God off guard and he had to figure something else out. He knew from the foundations of the earth, he knew before even that, but when he put his mind toward the creation, he knew what was going to happen and he made such a magnanimous plan that the verses we're in right now show us this plan was to reach more than just the Jewish people that through their temporary blindness, through their temporarily being set aside, he was going to bring in a whole nother people and into his name, that being in the Gentile world. Thank and you, Lord. I'm sorry? Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, as Dora says, yes. And it's made very clear the Gentiles were never left out. They could come in as a proselyte into Judaism prior, but now they're on an equal footing. The advantage that the Jew has today is that they've had the oracles of God. They've had the word of God. They had it passed down to them. That gave them an advantage over the, and I say this in the right way, don't any of you take insult, the heathen nations. And I call them that because they were idol worshipers, because they were worshiping other than the one true and living God. And yet, through this this stubbornness of Israel, he's opening the door for the Gentiles to come into what he wanted Israel to have and to act upon, and yet he's not closing the door to the Jewish people, not by any means. I'm one that's proof of that. Shaol Paul is one that's proof of it. There's two generations, hundreds of thousands of years apart, 2,000 years apart, to show you that always the Jewish people could get saved. I think I may be stressing that a little hard because I, I heard a teaching even very recently that just so saddens my heart when they talk about, oh, there's this veil of blindness and the Jewish people can hardly be reached. I'm not going to waste my time with them. And I think every life is precious. If you are one with, with the Lord in your heart, you should be a missionary. Who's your mission field? whoever the Lord puts around you, whether they be Jew or Gentile. Please don't sell my people off and say, oh, they're going to be too hard or it's not their time. No, that's not what God is saying. And proof of it is those who are getting saved all along. But there's something great going on here. And these are the verses we're in when we're, we're going to pick up word by word in, in verse 12. But let me back up just a little bit. And let me start in um, with verse 10, saying, Because you have kept my word of person... Oh, <laughs> yeah, I'm in Revelation 10. Sorry, I mean Revelation 3, verse 10. Let me go back to Romans 11 and verse... Okay, I'll start now because I'm seeing it differently here. I'll start with verse 11. I say, Shaol Paul talking, I say then, they, the Jewish people, did not stumble so as to fall, did they? And remember the construction was... No way did they stumble to the point that they've fallen and they can't get back up. Far from it. But their wrongdoing salvation, they're not receiving salvation the way that God wanted them to and presented to them, has come to the Gentiles. Remember now you get to come in without having to go into Judaism first. The key change that took place is that day we talked about where, the, where uh, we said that it's pivotal is the cross. Before, when looking toward the cross, they came into Judaism because that was the only one that looked, only um, relationship with God where you were looking toward the cross for your, your salvation. Now they're going to look back, okay? I think I've made it clear enough. I don't want to um, stay here too long, but... Their wrong, wrongdoing toward salvation has come to make the gen, has come to the Gentiles, and in that the response is not so that I'm done with the Jews, says God, so that the, only the Gentiles get saved now, says God. No, He says it's to make them, the Jews, jealous. There's a point to this. He is going to provoke them to jealousy by showing this this love picture to another group who is going to embrace it. 
and that's what we read as we go on now if they're again keeping in context if they're this is the Jewish people if their wrongdoing proves to be riches for the world okay so when they miss when they made this mistake the richest the enrichment is the salvation of the world the salvation for the Gentiles so if the Jews Jewish people the nation as a whole missing salvation proves to be this rich treasure for the world and their failure the Jewish failure riches for the Gentiles you Gentiles are now rich in the Lord like the Jewish people were when they were embracing this truth okay so and their failure is riches for the Gentiles how much more will their fulfillment be and for every single person who believes replacement theology who believes God's done with the Jew who believes that the Jews are getting what they deserve they deserve to be trashed they deserve to be annihilated they deserve to do whatever you know let the worst happen to them this is not God's attitude God's attitude right here says how much more rich will their fulfillment be well how can there be a fulfillment what does that mean if something's fulfilled it's completed isn't it it's something that's been there's been some sort of a process and now it's fulfilled when the prophecies of Yeshua's coming as sacrifice were fulfilled that was at the cross so what God is saying is this salvation that's for the Jewish people is going to yet be fulfilled not that he's done not that it's through not that it's off but there will be a fulfillment in that with the Jewish people and we see that in the restoration of the nation in line with their Messiah at his coming his second coming not his first coming to deal with sin but his second coming to set up his millennial kingdom this is when Messiah returns that's why we read verses like Isaiah Yeshaya 49 and verse uh, 6 and 7 Isaiah 49 verses 6 and 7 now keep in mind we keep everything in context we always think first who is being talked to who is it coming from who is it for we can always apply principles to ourselves but we have to leave it in context originally first so Isaiah is a Jewish prophet he is giving the message of God to the Jewish nation in this he is uh, well it's God now being quoted he says is it too small a thing that you should be my servant okay we know who God's servant is that's God the Son that's him coming as suffering servant is it too small a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Yaakov Jacob to restore the protected ones of Israel in this he moves from being that servant that suffers and dies to being the one who's going to raise Israel up who's going to restore those that he has protected of Israel who has God protected all the way through time of Israel that would be the remnant the remnant is the believing and in this case he's particularly talking about the believing Jewish people and seeing that the whole nation will finally come and embrace him as Messiah the nation will receive the fulfillment of its promises so what we're seeing is a lot of times going to have to pass we see again as we see it broken down in verse 6 I will also make you a light of the nations when Yeshua came he said I am the light of the world he was the light of the nations not just to Israel his light was going to go to the world so that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth his message is going to go we know literally to the ends of the earth in the tribulation period it will go out from the 144,000 who will carry it out it will go out because of the, the angels or uh, sometimes they're called eagles but like an angel in the heavens that will be declaring the gospel message and God sees too that it goes to the end of the earth but notice what he says in verse 7 also this is what the Lord the Redeemer of Israel and its Holy One says to the despised one to the one abhorred by the nation to the servant of rulers who was abhorred who who came as this servant and was abhorred we know is Yeshua Jesus he was the one that was despised but 
To this one, the servant of rulers, kings will see and arise, princes will also bow down, because of the Lord who is faithful, the Holy One of Israel who has chosen you. And here Messiah is going to be raised up. He's going to bring Israel into her fullness. She will be the head nation, and the world will come up to Israel for blessing also. For reign in their land, they're going to come into the nation of Israel. Look at chapter 60 in, in Isaiah. Chapter 60 and verse 1, Arise, shine. You may even have the word Jerusalem there. Some manuscripts have it and some don't. That's Jerusalem. But anyway, to, again, because it's Isaiah, it's to Israel in general. Arise, shine, for your light has come. The glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For behold, darkness will cover the earth, deep darkness the peoples, but the Lord will rise upon you. His glory will appear upon you. Nations will come to your light, kings to the brightness of your rising. Again, we, we go back to the light that has come. Messiah came in his first coming. We see darkness cover the earth, the tribulation period. We see the people in that great darkness. But the Lord saying to Israel, I will raise you up. My glory will appear upon you. Nations will come to your light. They're going to come to the light of Israel. Who is the light of Israel? Messiah. They're going to come in, in saving faith. They will finally see and understand who Messiah is. So Israel will head that in time. She is not doing that now. She does not recognize her Messiah as a whole. But we are seeing that God is promising restoration to the land of Israel. He never says he's done, he's through, he's finished, he's going to forget, abandon, turn his back on. We never read anything like that. Furthermore, when we go back to Revelation 11 and we continue reading in verse 13 now, if you have a good translation, you have the word but. Some manuscripts have the word for, but but's a little clearer to understand. So that's a connector. We've got to connect with what we've been saying. So we've just said that, that the Jewish people, their wrong has brought the richness of salvation to the Gentiles. But how much more their own fulfillment, the Jewish people's fulfillment, will be in that time of return. Now he says, but, Paul's going to apply what he has stated, a God's divine plan on his course of working on the, on the line of God's plan. In other words, Paul, even though he's going to declare he is the apostle to the Gentiles, he's going to show how he's doing that because he's reaching his own Jewish people. Not because he was through with his Jewish people, not because he was ready to cut them off or neglect them. Follow Paul's life. Every new city he went into, he went looking for the Jews to see if the Jews would believe first. What do you do with Romans 1.16? Paul's own testimony declaring, I, Paul, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Messiah, for it is the power of God unto salvation for all who believe. And then what do you do with this pregnant phrase for all those who think that it's done and over with the Jews and that Paul turned his back on them? Then why does he say to the Jew first and also to the Gentile? If he was done, if it was over, if his heart was turned against them, then why in, in chapter 10 did we read his heart's cry is that all of Israel would be saved? Why did we read in chapter 9 that he'd said, if I could even give up my own salvation for them, I would. That doesn't sound like someone who's saying to me, I'm done with them, I'm fed up with them. Were there people at a time in a place that Paul got fed up with? Yes. Have you ever been to that point yourself? Probably so. If you've been a good witness for the Lord, you've probably had times when you were getting stomped on and ignored and, and not liked. And for Paul, he was being beaten for it and, and suffering persecution because of it. Yes, there was a time that in an area, a specific location, he said, I'm going to wipe the dust off my sandals and I'm going on to the Gentiles. Notice, in the very next chapter, his very next city, he's right back in the synagogue. Obviously, he wasn't saying that a blanket statement against everyone, but to the Jews in that area, he was giving up on them, and he was moving to the Gentiles in that area. But we, we see his heart, we see it here, and we're going to see that he poured his heart out into his ministry. We know that. We see that. He is a great example for us to follow, but notice why he does it. 
what about your first love, Shaul Paul? What about your own people? How are you feeling? Well, let's look and see what he says in this verse. I'm speaking now to you who are Gentiles. He makes that very clear. He's speaking to you, the, the dear Gentiles in Rome. Therefore, insofar as I am an apostle of the Gentiles, I magnify my ministry. I'm going to do this to the best of my ability. I'm going to, to I want my, my ministry to glorify of course, to glorify God. I'm working for God. Remember, everything you do, do it heartily as unto the Lord and not unto man. But what is he saying? Um, and by the way, let me give you proof that shows he is an apostle to the Gentiles. This is important to understand. Yes, Paul was raised up to take the message to the Gentiles. What better person to raise up and take it than the one who has had those oracles, the one who has that Jewish background, the one who had that understanding, who is seeing the complete picture, to take it to the Gentiles. It, it, it was obvious it needed to be in the hands of one who was able to go. Paul's training gave him. He had Greek. He had the language of the world. He had a lot of, uh, of um, background that gave him the ability to speak to other peoples. So obviously everything that God had raised up Paul with wasn't just to make him a blessed man or a spoiled person with, with privileges. Every privilege God gave him right down to Roman citizenship was used in his ministry. But his slant was to be the apostle to the Gentiles. Apostle meaning sent one. Let me show you some verses that, that declare this. Oops, there we go. Okay, we're going to go to uh, Galatians 1.16. This is to the people who lived in Galatia. Um, he planted a church there. We know that one of his first. Galatians 1 and verse 16. He says, to reveal his son, God's son, to reveal his son in me so that I might preach him, the son of God, among the Gentiles. I did not immediately consult with flesh and blood. He's saying when he first got saved, he knew God was raising him up to take the message to the Gentiles. He got that message directly from God himself. So if you don't like his assignment, you're arguing with God because God gave him this assignment. Um, apostle means a sent one, and in this case, he was sent from God. Chapter 2, verse 7. Chapter 2, verse 7. On the contrary, seeing that I had been entrusted with the gospel to the uncircumcised. He's going to the Gentiles. Just as Kepha, as Peter, had been to the circumcised. That was that showed them to be Jewish because only people in the, in the world at that time who circumcised were the Jewish people who did it on the eighth day in accordance with the law that they had been given. If they did not circumcise their son on the eighth day, they would be cut off from the, the commonwealth of Israel, from the nation of Israel and the promises that would be theirs. So he made it very clear when you call them circumcised, you're calling them Jews. Uncircumcised was the rest of the, the world, the Gentile world. And he goes on, he says, just as, as Kephas, Peter's been called to the circumcised, for he who is at work for Peter in his apostleship to the circumcised was at work for me also to the Gentiles. He's saying, God's the one who set us up. He set Peter up to go to the Jews. He set me up to go to the Gentiles. Verse 9, recognizing the grace that had been given to me, to James and to Cephas and to John, others who were reputed to be pillars, gave to me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship so that we might go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. So right from the beginning, right from the inception of this time of grace and this building of the church that we understand is the called out assembly today, Paul saying immediately God sent me off to the Gentiles, God sent them off to the Jews. Well, if God was done with the Jews, and if it wasn't worth evangelizing them, and if they are so blinded they're not going to see and receive, then why did God send Peter? And why did he send James and Cephas and John? Why did he send, uh, well, Barnabas went with Paul initially, but why did he send these others? That would be foolish if it was done and over. So he's making it very, very clear. God has directed, he has sent me, but he has not excluded his own uh, original, the, the Jewish nation that he is still also trying to reach. Ephesians 3 and verse 8. To me, the very least of all saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unfathomable riches of Christ, of Messiah, of 
well, Christ. It doesn't even say Jesus Christ. It's just the Messiah. But notice that's why I said riches is salvation back in Romans where we're studying. Because here it tells us the unfathomable riches of Christ. That's not talking about the, the world that he owns everything of. That's talking about salvation. Now let me take you back to Romans on our way back to Romans 11. We'll stop off at Romans 15. We'll look at verses 15 and 16. And we read there in verses 15 and 16. But I have written very boldly to you on some points. So just to remind you again, because of the grace that was given to me from God. That's huge. Keep that in mind. We'll talk more about that in the future. But because of the grace that was given to me, Paul, from God, to be a minister of Messiah Yeshua to the Gentiles, ministering as a priest, the, the Jewish people understood what it was to be a priest. He is to be a priest of the gospel of God, so that my offering of the Gentiles may become acceptable, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. How are the Gentiles going to be sanctified? By the work of the Holy Spirit, as the gospel presentation is given to them. It's the same message. Everyone gets saved the same way whether they're Jewish or Gentiles, through the shed blood of Yeshua, Jesus. And this is what he is declaring. So in this, you never see where he ever, himself personally, talks about cutting off the Jews, cutting them off from salvation, or representing God as God doing that. No, no. In fact, back to chapter 11, we're going to see that key reason why he is so zealous in his apostleship to the Gentiles is to glorify God, but is also for another reason, and it comes up in verse 14. I, I'm looking to see, yeah, I am ready for 14. If I, I'm sorry, if somehow I may move my own people. Who are his own people? The Jewish people. Good, Dora. A plus, the Jewish people. If I can somehow move my own Jewish people to jealousy and save some of them. So what's he saying? I get it, God. You're going to use the dear Gentiles. You're going to make the Jewish people jealous with them. All right, let's get it on, God. Let's go. Let me get as many Gentiles saved as I can. Let me work hard and get them saved. It's wonderful. They get the riches of, of Messiah also. But in doing that, how many more Jewish people will come in because they're going to be made jealous? Hallelujah, God. You've got a great plan. It's going to cover the world. That's what we see here. That's our God. That's what he's doing. He's not fickle. He doesn't change his mind. He doesn't get fed up. That's human. That's us. We say enough is enough. He doesn't. He continues on and as a good parent does what he needs to do to child train, to direct, to redirect, to bring back, to call to repentance and in so doing the blessings that were originally only through the Jewish nation are now open to the world so that Jew and Gentile receive together. And Paul says, I'm all the more earnest. Let's reach more Gentiles that more Jews will get saved. And I'll put the word in there too because that's the way I think we should see it. Hallelujah. It's for both. And again, to bring it on, he says, for if their rejection, if the Jewish people Based on this, since, here's the fact, since their rejection proves to be the reconciliation of the world. Because they rejected, the world's getting this chance through grace to be saved. That's wonderful. Not through the law now. Not through them having to try to earn it the same way that the Jewish people were having to do all the commandments and try to keep favor with God and having to make the sacrifices because they couldn't. Now he's saying that, that their rejection the Jewish people's rejection proves to be the reconciliation of the world, again, through that grace, what will their acceptance be but life from the dead? What's that saying? The rejecting that, that people put in here, the casting away, all it was was a setting aside of Israel being the tool that God was going to use to reach the others. Remember, originally, Israel was God's tool in his hand to reach the Gentiles. The Gentiles weren't being left out, but they were channeled through the Jewish, well, I'll say the Jewish law, but you know, you're not saved by law. 
but it, it brought them to saving knowledge, okay? Now he's saying the tool that's being used now is in the Gentiles' hands to reach the Jews. That through them getting it and loving it and the Jewish people getting jealous for it, they're going to come in too. So you see, again, it's never set aside. It's never a cut off. It is a redirection on the basis of this fact by Israel temporarily being in this position where she's not in that right favor and being fulfilling her responsibility that the results will be the Gentiles are brought in but then notice here in this verse what it is saying for them okay because the word there T-H-E-I-R is speaking about the Jewish people so the world can be reconciled that's the Gentiles but what will their acceptance be but life from the dead so when Messiah does return when they get it right with Messiah both because we see it happening before in in small form but we'll see the whole nation eventually get right with Messiah but what it's saying is the fulfillment for them is life from the dead how do you get life faith in Messiah so he's basically saying wow I get it Israel won't be cut off. She's not going to die. She's not dead. She's going to be brought to life through this. She's going to be brought back in, into all that God had wanted for her in the first place. So he got it. He sees it. And he's going to give us in just a, a, a moment, um, well, he'll give us one other example first of the, of the first fruits, but he eventually is going to bring it into the grafting. So if you're familiar with the grafting, you're thinking that you're on the right track. Yes. Okay. So he says to, to, to the Jewish people first, so, and then the Gentiles. So when was it going to be our turn after the Jewish people were saved and they were going to preach to us? That's what was original. Mm -hmm. God raised up yeah. originally the nation of Israel to be the, the catalyst to reach the Gentiles. Now he's set aside them having that responsibility, given that to you Gentiles, that's right now to reach the Jewish people too. And then eventually, when he returns, Israel will come back into her position. She will be the priest to the world. The Lord will sit on the throne in Jerusalem. The nations will come up to Israel to receive their blessing. So eventually, it puts the, the Jewish people back into that headship. Again, not that they are a better, but God always has an order. And they'll be back into that position of headship to carry it to the rest of the world. Yeah. And that's millennium. That's in the millennium. Okay? Okay. I see a couple more questions. Let me finish my one thought of life from the dead, and then I'll go to Anne and then to Rowena, okay? Um, just because I don't want to get too far from it. The, the life from the dead, the proof of this, that this is speaking for the Jewish people, not just individuals, and, and you can't see it, just Gentiles. Ezekiel 37, Hezekiel chapter 37. I'm going to tell you on your own, read verses 1 to 14. Many of you are familiar. If this is the dry bones. This we know is Israel prophetically. She's back in the land, but there's no spirit in her. She's just like dead bones back in the land where God's promised her that land, at least to degree. She's got a lot more to, to claim than what she's got now. But notice key verses, which I'm going to take you. Let's drop down to verse 11. Then he said to me, and it's God speaking to Hezekiel, Son of man, these bones are the entire house of Israel. Behold, they say, our bones are dried up and our hope is perished. We are completely cut off. Israel could say that today. She could feel that way today because she's not receiving God's blessings. She's not in favor with God. She is still the house of Israel, but where's her hope? It, it, she's looking at her circumstances she would want to give up. But God says, therefore, therefore prophesy and say to them, this is what Adonai Elohim, Lord God, says. Behold, I'm going to open your graves, cause you to come up out of your graves, my people. I will bring you into the land of Israel. We saw that. In, in physical form in 1948. Then you will know that I am the Lord. That hasn't happened yet. This part still is going to be coming. 
then you will know that I am the Lord when I've opened your graves and caused you to come out of your graves my people they should have realized even to be back in the land is only by the hand of God it's a miracle that a people out of their land for almost 2,000 years remained a people and returned to their homeland it's a miracle there's a Jew alive today because of the intent to wipe them off of the face of the map through the centuries through the years so even in that the Lord is the one who has opened the graves. He has brought them back. But there's going to be even more. Verse 14, And I will put my spirit within you. You will come to life. I will place you in on your own land. This is We've only seen the beginning. We don't have the spirit in them as a whole yet. But when we do in the millennium, when they are all filled with the spirit of the Lord, that's when then you will know that I, the Lord, have spoken and have done it. This is bringing life out of the dead. Israel right now is a in a state of being the dead, dry bones. They need the Spirit of God put into them. Now I'm talking as a whole. Individuals have, but as a whole. And they will finally, when they finally do, then they will be acting as God's people, He being their God, and He will use them again in the priestly position to carry it on, carry His message out to the rest of the world. Okay, Anne, your question. Yes, I, I, was, um, I just wanted to confirm with you some of these references. Um, I, we started with, the, or didn't start, but going back to Galatians 1.16. Yes, you want the, okay. you want the verses for the, um, that he's apostle to the Gentiles? Well, hang on just a second. Was the reference before Galatians 1.16 was Romans what? Romans 1... In, in Apostle to the Gentiles, there's Romans 15, verses 15 and 16. Oh, um, that, that, that was... The prior... Was that, go ahead, I'm sorry. That was after the Galatians 1, 16. Yes. Well, just previous to that. Okay, previous well, to that is not Romans. I've got Isaiah 49 and Isaiah 60. Is that what you're looking for? Galatians 1, uh, 16? Galatians 1.16, uh, yeah. Was the return of, of his people. The, the return of Messiah, Messiah returning, fulfilling, all of that. No. That's that's Isaiah 49, 6 and 7. Oh. And You're giving the, the, you said first the Jewish people uh, weren't obeying, so then he brought salvation to the Gentiles. Right. And then the people returned at that point. What was that reference? I think that's got to be my Isaiah references, chapter 49, 6 and 7, okay, and chapter right. 60, verses 1 through 3. 1 through 3, okay. Um, and then, then we go on to Galatians. Yes. Galatians 1, 16. Yes. And, and 2, 7. Right. Then Ephesians 3, 8. Yes. Back to Romans 15, 15 through 16. Yes. And then to Ezekiel 37, 1 through 14. Yes. Did, did I miss one? No. Okay. Not unless I threw one in that I'm not remembering. Okay, that's good. Thank you. Sure. Okay. Rowena? Um, with my limited exposure to the Jews, because my son did work for several Jewish people, they tend to look down on the Gentiles. My son is a Gentile, and that's how he felt, and that's how major majority of his uh, co-workers felt, that they were like second-class citizens in the place where they were, and all their bosses were Jews. So I was wondering, how can the Gentiles then provoke them to jealousy? And uh, if they're looking down on the Gentiles, but then it dawned on me, and I'm remembering the testimony of Amir Sarfati, mm -hmm. how he was provoked to jealousy when he was invited by a friend to join dinner and coming from a broken home who almost wanted to commit suicide. He was just shocked when they started to pray for the meal and they mentioned the name Yeshua. And I think that was the start of him seeking like, why are you praying to Yeshua? So, I don't know if you can cite an example of how we can provoke them to jealousy. 
usually in a way that it's meant the provoking is by appreciating um, more than appreciating but we'll use that word for now what the Jewish people had that they let go of and that is the Word of God that is their scriptures having a love for the God of Israel and a love for his word is what should provoke them to realize you know that was something of value you've picked it up and you're finding riches in it you're finding a different type of wealth not an earthly wealth but you're finding a wealth you have a comfort you have a contentment you have a shalom you have answers where we have questions and you know it, it should provoke them to want hey I want that relationship with the God of Israel that you're claiming you now have that I should have had could have had my people had at one point but they walked away from um, I will apologize on behalf of, of his bosses shame on them they should never have made their employees feel that they were less because they were Gentile nowhere in scripture do we see that the Jews are better nowhere that was not this this order that God has is not here's our best or here's my best and then here's my second best never does God refer to any of his creation in that way he put things into an order he uses orderliness to to perform what he is doing when he works through man but he, in fact to the contrary he said in Deuteronomy and I think it's chapter 7 the Jews were the runt you were the least likely the least in number least in strength it basically was so the world would would look and say they can't do that how'd that get pulled off little David against a huge giant how did that happen how did David bring down a giant? How did a little people... He came in the name of the Lord. Exactly. He came in the name of the Lord. The advantage the Jew had was not their size, their wealth, their, their power, nothing. The, the, what they had was the Word of God. And that's what Paul says here. So the only way we can provoke, and I say we, I, let me to take that out because I'm Jewish but the Gentiles can provoke is to say to the Jewish people I love your land I love you as a people my Savior came through your race that's why I love and care because my Savior is Jewish the one that, that, that is taking care of me today is Jewish he has a love for his land and his people and because I love him I want to love what he loves and when they see you value what they don't value hopefully it'll make them want to value it also like that little two-year-old scenario I give you you know that they're not interested in the toy they quit playing with until another child suddenly wants it and then all of a sudden they gotta have it back so these are the ways to provoke them but he never should have been made to feel second class um, you know it, it's going to be true in any race there's going to be arrogant people and there's going to be people that are humble and then there's a lot in between but unfortunately he ran into some that that had the chip on their shoulder um, I would like to ask them if I squared off with them face to face what makes you better because you're the employer well then that's a blessing from God that he's given you that you should be blessing your workers with a good employer should be treating his employees very well because what God has given us is not to make us comfortable but to make us enable us to share comfort with others so I would take them to task for their attitude but very often our Jewish people will say to a Gentile even wow you know my scriptures better than I do and a good answer is well that's because I love those scriptures I love hearing what the God who created both you and me has to say to us do you know he has a special plan for you he has a special plan for your nation do you realize you're back in that land as a people because God did a miracle that wouldn't have happened apart from God 
but he loves you so that he's taken you through the centuries through every attempt satan has done to annihilate you he's kept you alive do you know he didn't do that for the hittites he didn't do it for the Girgashites. he didn't do it for the malachites he's let other nations come to an end but he's got a love for you you are the apple of his eye he wants a relationship with you and i am so blessed that i've gotten to come in and receive that same blessing not in place of you but along with you and i'd love to show you what i'm talking about i'd love to show you in god's love letter to you what he has to say do you know god has a great plan for the nation of israel do you know she wins in the end Usually Jewish people who we're witnessing to love hearing that side. <laughs> because you got to realize, statistically, Israel doesn't have a chance. You look at that. She's a fraction of land. She's got 22 enemies that want to wipe her off into the Mediterranean Sea. You really think that she's going to stand in that land on her own two feet and not be pushed off into the sea in her own power and own strength? Oy. I mean, come on, folks, open your eyes. She's so outnumbered. If you were putting down bets, you wouldn't put it down on Israel. You'd put it down on the Arab nations. You know, the, the odds are 22 to 1. <laughs> but the same God of David, of David, who brought down a giant is the same God who's on little Israel's side to bring down the giant who is against Israel. Who is against Israel because he's against God. And that's Satan. Satan hates the Jew because he hates God. And God's got a special plan for you and he wants to wipe it out and then he'll have his world, his kingdom, and his way. And that's what he's trying to do. But God wins. We've got the final chapter. These are the ways to try to provoke them to jealousy. Make them realize they had something they let go of. Ask them, do you know what your own scriptures say? And do you know your scripture is a love letter? That this is something that when someone writes a letter to you because they're not with you, they're wanting to express their heart to you. They're wanting to talk to you about something very, very important to them and to you. That's what God has given and if you're not into reading what he's, what he's given to you to know, well, let me tell you, you're missing out on a world of great things, of promises, of hope, of strength, of wisdom, of knowledge. Not knowledge that will get you something of the world that's going to tarnish, but this is something that will get you an eternal riches that are out of this world. Now, hopefully, they want to know a little bit more, and you go into more specifics. But this is what it's talking about. What did the Gentiles pick up here? They picked up the Word of God. They're giving the Word of God out. The majority today that are going out and are sharing are Gentile missionaries. There are some Jewish missionaries. Praise God. I'm privileged to be one. But we need more of us, too. <laughs> uh, but do you begin, does that begin to answer your question? And again, shame on those who think that they're any better. What makes a person better than another person? What makes a race better than another race? No good answers there. There is nothing. We're all one race, one people. It's called the human race. And we all have our, our good and our bad. Um, the Jewish people are told how stiff-necked we are. Okay, I think you're right. We are. But I'm going to ask you, are you Gentiles an exception to that? <laughs> I think we can see just as much stiff-necked stubbornness doing it my own way, apart from God's way, among the Gentiles too. Because I think it's a common denominator to men. So equal level equal footing and that's where god has us today even in the way that we come into his presence it's not one through the other anymore and it, it, it's directly and it's always and only through the shed blood of yeshua jesus and that's where i would hit them too do you know the greatest love story do you know that that someone loved you so much they were willing to die for you let me introduce you to him his name is Yeshua. 
because he came to the Jewish people. He's Jewish for a reason. Let me take you into your genealogy and show you. Let me show you what it means to be a kinsman redeemer. Let me show you what God wants to do with Israel. Yeah, and begin to open them to see these things that the, they should hopefully want to embrace. And in fact, I think that gets us back on point because when we look at verse 16, we're going to see how God's looking at the people and we're going to see what is there. So I, I think um, we're going to talk about the root and the branches and all that. I think if that I'll get Rhonda's question, but I think that'll bring us back on to, to verse 16. Yes, Rhonda. call it sibling rivalry between the Jewish people and the early believers you commonly called Christians you have to know that name in the right way but there was you know first you have the Jews like Paul persecuting the Christians and you have Christians who got an attitude at the Jews for it and you have the attitude of okay they, they're Christ killers you know they deserve to be punished you have all of that going on and you have it back and forth on both sides um, so yes anyone can jump and take a part of that um, and build their case for how they are the Jew hatred that I hear in the church today and is it there I'm so sorry to say I don't want to say it's alive and well it's alive and sick but it's doing you know it's alive in fundamental churches we even heard part of a video today that, that the slant I can tell where they're going I haven't even heard the end yet and I'm really but they're taking a scripture and they're twisting in its meaning yes when Kepha Peter made his sermon to those Jewish people living at the time who were involved in the crucifixion he did call them out but he didn't do it in the way that they're saying that he's calling out all Jews and, and saying they're all bad he was Jewish himself he'd have to be calling himself out and we all know the truth of the scriptures are the Lord laid down his life himself and what crucified him all of our sins Jewish sins Gentile sins from the first person to the last person before the, this magnanimous plan of God comes to that conclusion so we know that we have that we get that from Scripture and anybody can derail with just a scripture and when they're called dogs um, the, the woman who was speaking was Gentile and the Lord said to her you know that that because dogs was like the word heathen also you know that meant the Gentiles it meant the heathen it meant the worldly um, versus the people who are to be the people of God and she was wanting what the people of God have and yet she was Gentile and the Lord knew what he was doing he wasn't calling her you dog but he was saying you know aren't you of the dogs basically and it's not quite how he said it I'm paraphrasing here but my point is she shot back at him but even the puppies eat the food from the master's table eat the crumbs from the master's table so she basically was saying yeah I'm beneath you but I'd like some of those crumbs please and he commended her for her faith and her belief and we see his love toward them you can look at the New Covenant scriptures and you can look at it and say that it puts Rome in a good light. You've got the Roman centurion at the crucifixion saying truly this was the Son of God. You have um, Cornelius 
opening up to um, to want to, you know, he's a God-fearer, he's loving God, and he's ready to be saved. And you have Peter saying, he's not kosher, Lord. I won't have anything to do with somebody not kosher. That's the meaning behind that, that dream. But God's showing Peter, don't call unclean what I've called clean. You know, don't look down on them because they're Gentile. He's changing Peter's outlook. They did look down on the Gentiles as heathen, as idol worshipers. But God seeing the value of that soul and bringing that soul in and showing there's an equality here in the souls. And that's where we need to have our focus. Again, that neither is better than the other. Neither is to be raised up and the other to be um, trampled underfoot. And even when Israel is the head nation, the world is to receive the same blessings. Israel is going to receive the former reign and the latter reign as long as she's in fellowship with her God. The nations that are coming up, like at Sukkot, the time that we just had, the three times, one of the three times they're supposed to go up, they also then will receive former rain and latter rain. That's the same blessing that they're receiving also. So again, it's very, very important to leave things in context. And I think that we do need to see here in Romans 11, and my tablet, there we go. Oh, okay, it's doing funny things on me. Um, I think we need to see how much the Lord is showing us in Romans 9, 10, and 11. He still has a great plan with the Jewish people, but the Gentiles are to be brought in on that equal footing. Yet, dear Gentiles, don't get the idea that now you got it all right, they got it wrong, and that makes you superior and you better. Don't boast. Look out. That's what we're going to be reading. And realize who you've been brought into. You've been brought into a very Jewish root. When you got grafted into this tree, this root was Jewish. And when you get down to the root system, that's Yeshua. But I'm talking about the root, the beginning of it was Jewish. Your, your patriarchs are Jewish. David is Jewish. The Lord did come through the Jewish line. So, you know, there, there was a value there not to be discarded. Let me bring us into verse 16. If I don't say enough of this um, to answer fully, then then bring me back to it on the other end. Um, but again, we, we see the excitement of Jew and Gentile both getting saved in the prior verses. And now verse 16, because remember the, the Jewish people rejecting has brought the reconciliation to the Gentiles, but the Jewish people will also receive life out of death. They'll be the, the dry bones with the Spirit of God put in them. Verse 16, if, and again it, it means now, in view of, since would be a better word, since the first piece of dough is holy, the lump is holy. And if the rest is holy, I'm sorry, if the root is holy, the branches are as well. Okay, if you don't know uh, the Jewish background, you're not going to understand that. Let me take you real quick to Numbers, Bamidbar, Numbers chapter 15, and we're going to look at verses 18 to 21. Numbers 15, 18 to 21. The Lord's um, speaking to Moshe, to Moses, saying, Speak to the sons of Israel and say to them, When you enter the land where I am bringing you, then it shall be that when you eat from the food of the land, you shall lift up an offering to the Lord. Of the first of your dough, you shall lift up a loaf as an offering, as an offering of the threshing floor, so you shall lift it up. From the first of your dough, you shall give to the Lord an offering throughout your generations." Okay, this is, when we go back to Romans, this is the basis of what Paul is talking about when he talks about this, this um, what do you call it? <laughs> um, dough. This first piece of dough. Okay, the first that you have, this is the first fruits. And by the way, that's called the heave offering. If you ever hear that name given and wonder, that's the heave, H-E-A-V-E, -E, the heave offering. Now, the whole lump of dough would get considered... I'm going to use the word sacred, sanctified to the Lord, because of the portion that was given to the Lord. So they took off a first part. They brought that in and dedicated it to the Lord. The first portion of everything was to be offered to the Lord. And in doing that, it made it holy, H-O-L-Y. Holy means set apart for God. 
there's a purpose, okay? That first that was given to God to for it to be holy to God, God's purpose of using it, that was the priest to take the message to the world. Because remember, Israel's not to take the message to only Israel. Israel's to take the message to the world. Okay, so it's to go to the world, but this lump, this first part of this dough is Israel. It's the body of Israel. The people of Israel was the first that was offered to the Lord. When it was offered to the Lord, it made the whole lump holy. The whole lump would be, you know, would be whoever comes into that, who's a part of what the, the has now been given. And we see that by looking at the root. If the root is holy, well, what's the root of the Jewish people? Okay, because we're talking Israel's looked at by God as holy. The root of Israel is those patriarchs, Abraham, Yitzhak, Yaakov, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and coming on down to becoming a whole nation. First God chose a person, then he chooses and works through the, a family, through a specific tribe. We know all of this to bring, you know, who Messiah is. But what he's saying is, you're being grafted into this heritage. You're coming in to be a part of this Jewish family, so to speak. So the branches that are holy as well are also Jewish branches, but he brings out a little more clearly, and I'm trying to think where I, I okay, so I don't want to just jump, I want to get you there. Okay, I told you the root of what comes down to be the nation that's blessing the world with, with this sacredness, with this holiness unto God, starts with Abraham, okay? God first called out Abraham, He's the first one to cross over that made him a Hebrew. He crossed over from idolatry to worshiping the one true and living God. So we're going to look at the root as being Avraham for a moment. Now we know it goes all the way back to, to God, you know, but stopping right here, then we know that we also hear, and in fact, remember it's probably too far back in your mind, but go back just to, to Romans 9, because we looked at this when we were there. Romans 9, we're going to look at verses 6 through 8. Romans 9, verse 6, we start with, But it is not as though the word of God has failed, for they are not all Israel who are descended from Israel, nor are they all children, because they are Abraham's descendants, but through Isaac your descendants shall be named. Okay, let me break it down before I get to the, the next verse. We've got, the word of God hasn't failed. Just because Israel as a nation has rejected doesn't mean there's failure here because not all the children of Abraham are Israel. Paul says later not all of not all of Israel is Israel. He's meaning not all of the nation of Israel is believing Israel. Not all of Abraham's is the seed of Abraham. It had to come not through Ishmael, it had to come through Isaac, okay? So we're beginning to see that narrowing down. That's, uh, did I read that in verse 7? Nor are thou children because they're Abraham's descendants, but through Isaac your descendants shall be named. That is, it's not the children of the flesh who are the children of God, but the children of promise are regarded as the descendants. Now we've got a declaration that's taking it past just the physical. Now we're seeing that Isaac is representing something. We're seeing in Isaac the spiritual. Isaac had a, a um, heart for God. Isaac was willing to allow his father to make a sacrifice out of him if that's what God was requiring. Isaac was not a child when he was uh, almost offered up as a sacrifice. He wasn't a little boy that had to be obedient to his father who had power over him and could muscle him and do whatever he wanted. Avraham was probably about 130. Isaac was probably about 30. If you want to go exactly to what they think to be a picture of Yeshua's age, then 133 and 33. Now, you tell me a 30-year-old man who is, you know, healthy. We're not told Isaac was a wimp, a weakling. You tell me a 30-year-old who couldn't overpower a 130-year-old man. You know, no, obviously he could. So what we see is the spiritual side of Isaac, his willingness to be a sacrifice, his willingness to lay down his life in obedience to his God. What we're beginning to see is that those who are spiritually in line with the Lord 
are the ones who are called the descendants, the children of promise. And that's what it, it is saying, that they would be the ones who are the children of God, the children of the promise, and they are then declared the descendants. So when, when they're claiming Abraham as their father, that's not their in with God. They have to come through the spiritual line that we see. So they come in spiritually. So when we take that to Romans 11, to where we're at now, what we're seeing in this, what, what Abraham is being referred to, or the branches being um, considered holy also, we're seeing that those who are of Abraham's seed, spiritually speaking, being the ones that are found in faith, okay? We just saw that. Romans 9 told us that, that they had to be of the certain line. It had to come through Isaac because now we're separating the spiritual from the non-spiritual. So we have now a, a lump that's made holy as we follow the spiritual line. Those who are in the, that are the ones that are part of that lump. Now, at the same time, while well, we know that there are those, and I'll say it again, in Israel who are the ones that are right with God. Not all Israel is. We see that in the fact that um, Jerusalem is called a holy city at the time of the crucifixion. When, when Messiah is crucified, it's referred to as a holy city. That's Matthew 27, 53, if you want to look it up. That even though great wickedness is going on, the Lord cast out many changers out of the temple. We know that the world is not receiving Messiah. The Jewish people or the Gentiles are not receiving and believing. They're turning their back on the Son of God who's walking among them, who's performing miracles that should show them he's the one from God. But as a whole, yes, our individual is turning, but as a whole, the, the nation was not, as a whole, Jerusalem had, a, the crucifixion comes, not a heart for God. And yet they're called a holy city. The children of Abraham are also called in general that way, even though the only ones that really are of Abraham are the ones that are of that spiritual seed. They're the ones that are beloved for the Father's sake. He loves all of Israel, but he has that relationship with those who have come into them. So what we're seeing is when that first was, was given spiritually, those who align themselves spiritually are considered holy along with Avraham. Remember, the seed of Avraham ends up being Messiah, singular, and when we come into Messiah, then we receive the blessings of Abraham. How is the whole, all the nations blessed through Abraham? They're blessed through Abraham's seed. They're blessed through the one who is Yeshua, who does bring blessings to all. So we've got this original, this lump that was holy. It was from the root that was holy and the branches that are connected are holy as well. Again, not saying that everybody is, but those who are brought in in the spiritual sense are. Now, Paul is, is going to hit on the rising prejudice of the Gentile against the Jewish believer. And that's what he's wanting to emphasize here is that this whole new, this called out assembly, this church body that's starting to raise up, lest you Gentiles who are making it up the, the proportion, the, the greater proportion of numbers, lest you get all up on your high horse, look how great we are. He's saying, remember your root, your ancestry, your what brought life to you is Jewish. Don't get all in their face and come against them because this that God started with, he's going to restore that also. So you don't want to find yourself on the opposite side of God, do you? You don't want to think that, that you know, you don't need the Lord or that you're good by your own. No, you're good by putting your faith in, and I'll say it my way, in the Jewish Messiah, in the God of Israel and his son, Yeshua, Jesus. So realize that God still has reserved those who are Jewish. They're going to be a part. We're going to see that. He has a full restoration for them. But there is a special work that he's called this called out assembly, this church group to do. But they should not take it as a point of arrogance. 
is not meant for, for boasting because what did they do? They didn't do anything that's worthy of boasting. And well, let's see how we can say that. Verse 17. But if some of the branches were broken off, and we know we could use the word since there again. Since some of the branches were broken off. That's the apostate, the, the rejecting nation that's been broken off. Okay, it, it shows that there's a remnant that's not broken off. It doesn't say all of it's broken off. It says some of it's broken off. And you, you Gentile, being a wild olive, you're up from the heathen. Your ancestry is not Jewish that had a relationship with God. You know, it, it's, you're totally wild, okay? Take that the right way. But you Gentiles who are wild were grafted in among them and became partaker with them, okay? You're coming in. You're not, this isn't something new being done over there. You're coming in. You're being grafted in. Um, becoming partaker with them of the rich root of the olive tree. We've always already seen this root is a Jewish root. So what's going on here? Well, a wild olive tree, it, this is very contrary to nature. And normally what's wild can't succeed. What Paul is using is in the, the natural, he's using a fact to show that the only reason why you're going to succeed is because of the grace of God. It's not because you're so great, you can get up on your box and be, look at me. No, you need to realize that you're coming in because of God's grace. And the wild's going to succeed when it's grafted into the natural, not the other way around. It's not the opposite. I'll, I'll hit that more in a moment when I talk about the grafting. But let me just move forward for a minute, okay? Where it says, among them, you were grafted in among them. The Gentiles are brought in with the Jewish people to make up one body of Messiah Yeshua. And Paul hits that very hard in Ephesians. Look at Ephesians 3, 6. We have one, well, let's, let's look at it real quick because this is very important. This is where we're going to see our equality, whether we be Jewish or whether we be Gentile. Ephesians 3, 6, we read, to be specific that the Gentiles are fellow heirs and fellow members of the body, fellow partakers of the promise in Messiah Yeshua, in Christ Jesus, through the gospel. Okay, he goes on and he talks about how the middle wall of partition to separate has been broken down. Jew and Gentile come in together. It is the one new man. Okay, God broke down that middle wall of separation. He broke it down with the cross. It was the cross that made that way open for Jew and Gentile to be together, to be partakers together, both of them to draw from the same root, that root that was Avraham, and be blessed with and through Avraham. Remember Genesis 12, 3, I will bless them that bless thee, I'll curse them that curse thee, but through you, Abraham, all the nations of the world will be blessed. How are all the nations of the world blessed through Abraham? Was he that great of a person that he did it? Of course not, but we take it all the way down to Galatians 3 where we see our answer spelled out for us. Galatians 3, 6, Just as Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him for righteousness, therefore recognize that it is those who are of faith who are the sons of Abraham. The scripture foreseen that God would justify the Gentiles by faith. Preach the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, all the nations will be blessed in you. If, the, if saying all the nations will be blessed in you was a preaching the gospel beforehand, then that means all the nations are going to be blessed through the cross, who is the relative of Abraham. He is Jewish. He's going to go back through, all the way through. Abraham is going to be his seed, literally, and then speaking spiritually. This is how the world is blessed, is through the Messiah, through Yeshua, Jesus. So we're all partaking from that same root. When we look at that root, we're looking at that olive tree. That olive tree is representing now the blessings of faith promised to Avraham, to Avraham's seed, and to all the families of the earth. 
Now, here's the interesting note when you get into the grafting, as we're going back to Romans 11. When you get into the grafting, a branch that's desired is cut at an angle. It's brought to the root stalk of the trunk. It's planted into a shallow cut with the root stalk's trunk. So you've got the, the trunk, a cut's been made into the trunk to bring this branch in. The two are bound together with either a tape or a string or something where they're bound tight together and they're, they're kept bound in whatever material they're bound in until the two have grown together. In essence, that wild branch could be a whole other tree, but now it's been grafted into the original olive tree so that the two have become one. The grafted in is now part of the branch or the rootstock of the original olive tree. Now, if you want a new tree, the only way you can do it is above the graft, everything has to be removed to start a new tree. In other words, this is a binding together, the two becoming one. What is very interesting, oh, and can it be reverted? Because some say, can God turn it back? Well, the answer is yes, you can have a severe pruning, but it would cause the rootstock to sprout below the graft to revert back to the rootstock. And in essence, then it would knock off all that wild. But that's not what happens. That has to be by someone taking a severe action to it. What we are seeing and what is interesting is usually the wild being grafted into the natural is not the, the good way to go. But in this case, the wild brought a... Um, okay, what's the word? A renewing to the old, and the old then researching helped the new, the wild, become good. Okay, remember how the wild's grafted into the old, to the original? Okay, so the Gentiles grafted in, and the, the original needed that kickstart, needed that, oh, I should have held on to that. I'm jealous for it, I want it. And they kind of wake up and get going, and now they start producing, so that you've got one that's part Jewish, part Gentile, together producing one tree that's going to go on and produce the fruit. This shows the bringing together, and it's the opposite of what nature usually does. Nature, is, it's, it's um, the wild does not do good to the original. I'm having a hard time saying it. It's contrary to nature. Okay, just trust me in that. Look up um, gardening if you need to, to to understand it better. But it's a beautiful picture because it's showing how one helped research the other, not replace, but research, bring a new life, bring a new energy, and the, the two are growing together as one. The ancients used the wild olive graft upon an old olive tree Reinvigorate, that's what I wanted to reinvigorate the tree. Both the true and the graft were influenced by each other. The wild graft, though, in all honesty, didn't produce as good of olives as the original stock. Okay, so there's your little bit of letdown there, but together they are doing what they're supposed to be doing. And because they're coming together, because they're, they're both being grafted together, and they're grafted into that trunk, and remember we've got to go down to the root, and the root all the way down. I don't mean the root that's Abraham, but I mean the very beginning, the seed. Okay, let's take it all the way down to the seed, and the seed is who? Galatians told us. Galatians 3 tells us the seed is Yeshua, Jesus. So in seeing this, in seeing who it is, it is the Son, S-O-N, capital S-O-N. Now we see verse 18, so you who have been grafted in, you become partaker with that rich root, with the, the Jewish root of the olive tree. Don't be arrogant toward the branches. Gentiles, don't be arrogant toward the Jewish people. If you are arrogant, um, you, well, let me read the whole thing and then I'll break it down. If you are arrogant, remember that it is not you who supports the root, but the root supports you. Okay, remember you were brought in, you needed the root. And if you cut yourself off from the root or get cut off from the root, you're not going to survive. You would die off. Okay, so no room for, for pride, no room for boasting. The life force, the blessings are received by the Gentiles through the Jew. 
I'm going to spell it out through the Jew called Yeshua, through Jesus, who was of Jewish heritage. It's not that the Jew is blessed through the Gentile, but the Gentile comes in and gets blessed through the Jew because we're talking about the Jew, okay? So stop glorifying, stop boasting, stop being arrogant against the, the Jewish people. If you are, you're assuming the glory that belongs to the Lord, and you need to realize, and it's very emphatic, He is supporting you. Do you really want to boast against Him? I don't think so. Realize that you're supported, you're sustained, you are, are receiving the blessings that you are, through the Jew, through the Jew called Jesus, but through his Jewish race that passed down his word. If we didn't have the, the scrolls from the Jewish people, we wouldn't have a good majority of our word of God. We would not have it. And look how it enriches us. Okay, finishing the thought, verse 19. You will say then, branches were broken off so that I might be grafted in. Okay, true. Yes, there were those who were cut off to make room for you to come in. The ones that were cut off were the ones that were rebellious heart that would not turn to the Lord. The Gentile might feel superior because of that. He might be comparing himself to those branches. But what he should be looking at is what's his root system. What's feeding him? Don't be arrogant against what is feeding you. And that, of course, we know is Yeshua, Jesus, who is feeding him. It goes on and it says, okay, yes, they were broken off because of their unbelief, but you stand by your faith. Do not be conceited, but fear. Okay, you didn't do anything that was better than the Jew. You got here by faith. So don't get conceited. Don't get to thinking you're all great and high and mighty. Realize it's all by faith. And that's key. That's very key. And who are they to fear? The fear that they would be be talking about is a humility. It's a, a, a respectfulness. And of course, it is to our God, to the God of Israel and to his son, Yeshua Jesus. So yes, there are those who were cut off. They were cut off because they didn't believe. You were brought in because of your faith. It's not that, that we need to try to look and say, oh, well, you are better than that one, but that one's better than this one. No. Do away with all of that and realize you're all drawing. You need to go all the way down to that seed that feeds you, and that is Yeshua Jesus. And furthermore, you dear Gentiles, if you want to get all conceited and all high and mighty, then verse 21 is for you. For if God didn't spare the natural branches, the, the Jewish branches, the original, the Israel branches, he will not spare you either. If they got cut off for unbelief, what makes you think that if you're thinking it's all you and you're not putting your faith in him, that you're not going to be cut off too? In, in other words, yes, you would be cut off also. The Gentiles were artificially grafted in. The Jewish people were were naturally there and yet they were cut off then how much more would he cut off something artificial you know it's just and again we're talking corporately but but you get the point there so verse 22 see then and here's the whole climax of it see then the kindness and the severity of god the kindness the benevolent kindness have you ever been in a service that says, okay, we're going to take up a special offering now? We call it the benevolent offering. That's an offering that's an extra above and beyond, and they use that offering to give to the poor and to the needy, to help those who are the neediest of the needy. Benevolence is, is giving something to someone who is in need. That's what God did. He, out of his kindness, has given. That's how you need to look. Otherwise, look at the severity of God. Look at how rough, how rigor, how abrupt, you know, he could be. He could cut you off if you're in a state that's not acknowledging that your blessings are coming through him. And, and he shows that. He says, um, uh, okay, see then the kindness and severity of God. To those who fell severe, to those who turned away who became rebellious, who refused the, the unbelievers, who were cut off, that's severe. That's not light. That's severe. 
Okay, there you see it. That's the nation at this stage. It is cut off from being the avenue God's using to bring that message of his grace to the world. If you, um, but to you, God's kindness, if you continue in his kindness, otherwise you too will be cut off. As long as you stay in believing and recognizing and giving credit to God who is the one who does it, as long as you're acting in your faith and not in some sort of false pride, then you'll see his kindness. You'll see his goodness. Now, there were the Jewish people who thought that they were indestructible. We got it in. We've got our in with God because we're Jewish. They were the ones that were full of pride who were cut off, who were not receiving the blessings because they weren't coming into this by faith in the one who could bless them. And the Gentiles, it's the same way that they can be cut off also. And in fact, we're going to see that there is a change coming. Okay, let's keep reading. Um, let's see, have I said, well, maybe I want to at the end. Okay, for otherwise you too will be cut off. There is a time of cutting off. What I'm saying is there is the time of the ending of the Gentile age. We know we're in the age of the Gentiles right now, but there is a time when God's going to return to Israel's plan first and, and up front where he's going to use Israel as that head lead again so he is warning you want to stay in you want to stay right with God you want to be trusting in God God is is going to do something more okay verse 23 is going to tell us that so verse 22 we see the kindness we see the severity depending on how we are acting whether we're in faith believing and, and realizing his grace or whether we're of ourselves verse 23 and they also if they do not continue in their unbelief here's your nation of israel if they don't continue in their unbelief they're going to be grafted in god is a god of second chances he doesn't say to anybody i gave you a chance you blew it go away no he says if they um, don't stay in their unbelief they'll be grafted in for god is able to graft them in again the unbelieving Jews in this hypothetical condition, if they don't remain apart, if they do turn back to their God, and we will see Israel do that as a nation at the second coming, when they finally do look up, see the one who is, who's been pierced, mourn for him, Zechariah 12.10, this is when they will be grafted back in, in a permanent status as a nation. Again, I'm not talking individuals, I'm talking as a whole, as a nation. They will be grafted back in, and he's telling the Gentiles, don't think, again, don't be arrogant, because I'm not done with those natural branches. I'm going to graft those back in also. Um, verse 24, if or since you were cut off from what is by nature a wild olive tree, and contrary to nature, you were grafted in into a cultivated olive tree. Remember, it's not the natural way that it goes. How much more will those who are the natural branches be grafted into their own olive tree? Again, I just hear Paul all over this saying, where do you have room to believe God is done with the Jew? That he's done with the nation of Israel and that he's given it all to the church instead. He's telling them right here, they're going to be grafted back in that, that the, this, he, God's plan worked. The Gentiles provoked the Jewish people to jealousy. They're going to realize, and as a whole, they will turn back to their God, and they will be brought back in, cultivated back in, to be a part of the good tree. That's what he's bringing out. It gives no room to be done or replace Israel. And then he says, I don't want you ignorant brothers and sisters and you've got to pause in the right place because as dr mcgee would say he's not saying i don't want you ignorant brothers and sisters <laughs> he's saying i don't want you ignorant brothers and sisters those in this faith i don't want you to be uninformed i don't want you to be unaware something here is very important i don't want you to be uninformed of this mystery in scripture mystery is something that's been hidden it's, it was hidden for a purpose by the counsel of God, 
but is now being revealed so that the believer can understand it. So Paul's going to open up this mystery then. I don't want you to miss or be misunderstanding, misinformed. I want you to see so that you will not be wise in your own estimation. You won't be conceited. You won't be self-opinionated. You won't think the merit is in yourself. A partial hardening has happened to Israel. Keyword, partial. A hardening, a blindness, a mental dullness has happened. Okay, it has come. This has happened. We do see this. Israel's nation isn't in that right relationship with her God. But it's saying that this partial harsh hardening has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. That means there's a deadline for this. That means that God's plan where he's provoked those branches to come back in, to be grafted back in, that they are going to come back in, and he's going to go on with that plan that he had for Israel. What's the time that causes the change? The fullness of the Gentiles has ended. Now, understand very clearly, there's two phrases in Scripture. One is the fullness of the Gentiles, and the other is the times of the Gentiles. They're not to be confused. When it's talking about the fullness, it's talking about the body, it's talking about those who are saved through grace, it's talking about the called out assembly, it's calling about this assembly, and that when this has been completed, and I get this from Acts 15, oh my word, I just saw the, you know what, can we go over five minutes? Because it, I don't want to cut this off here. Let me, let me try to do it. It may take ten. Eh, maybe I need to pick it up next week. Wow, I really, I wanted to get through it. Um, it it's 3.35, I don't want to race through this. I wanted to start with Genesis and our fresh start in our new place, but maybe it'll be good to bring them on to the same page, and then we'll go back to the beginning. Let me just tie up my thought here to make this very clear to you. There's a difference between the fullness of the Gentiles and the times of the Gentiles. Look with me real quick at Acts 15. We're going to look at Acts 15, 14 to 17, and, and we'll do this quick. But uh, I got too bogged down. Sorry, folks. But I'm going to trust. I hope that what I'm saying has been important and that you won't mind it continuing one more week. Uh, Acts 15, 14. Simeon, or Shimon, has described how God first concerned himself about taking a people for his name from among the Gentiles. Okay, we know that's what's going on. The words of the prophets agree with this just as it is written. After these things I will return. I will rebuild the fallen tabernacle of David. That's very Jewish, okay? Yes, God's taken a people for himself among the Gentiles. But I'm going to go back, God speaking, I'm going to go back to the tabernacle of David. That's very Jewish. God met the nation of Israel in the tabernacle. That was the place of meeting, the tent of meeting. I will rebuild its ruins. I will restore it so that the rest of mankind may seek the Lord and all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord, who makes these things known from long ago. So obviously the Gentiles aren't suddenly cast away. They're part of that. But God's saying, I'm going to go back to that plan with Israel. So we see there is a time, a partial hardening of Israel for a time. When the fullness of the Gentiles has come in, that's the body of, of um, this church age, this called out assembly, the body of Messiah. When it's fulfilled, when it's completed, when the last one is saved, I'll put it that way, then the church is completed. When the church is completed, then God's going to go back and finish off what, he's, what he had begun with Israel. That helps us understand the times of the Gentiles. The times of the Gentiles, and Luke 21, 24 refers to that. Let me read it real fast for you. Luke 21 and verse 24. Luke 21, 24. And they will fall by the edge of the sword and will be led captive into all the nations. Jerusalem will be trampled underfoot by the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. Okay, times of Gentiles, now we're talking about nations. We're looking at what's happening in the world. We're seeing Jerusalem being trampled underfoot. We're seeing that, that something is going on in the world. We're not talking individuals and talking salvation. Now we're talking God's plan with the nations. 
And what we see, and here's where I'll pick it back up next week, we see Daniel's image that was prophetic being fulfilled. Daniel chapter 2 verses 32 to 35 is the, the image, the explanation that helps you understand it is verses 44 and 45. This talks about the Gentile world empires that will be destroyed by Messiah's coming to set up Israel as the world empire. Remember real fast, head of Babylon, silver Medo-Persia, two shoulders, um, the breast area going down, the the um, well, the breast and the rest of the arms, I'll put it that way. Um, okay, sorry. <laughs> okay, I'm trying to hurry. You got Babylon, Medo-Persia, then you have Greece. The legs are Rome, and you're going to see a, a revived Roman Empire, the feet that are iron and clay. That's the revived Roman Empire. Those are the Gentile nations that are to rule during the time of the Gentiles. Nowhere in there do you see Israel ruling because Israel is not in her position as she should have been because that's been set aside while God's calling out this Gentile people, filling the, the Gentile fullness, taking the, that out, finishing what, he, what the, the Gentile world, world rule is until he returns as Messiah and sets up his kingdom making Israel now the head um, the head nation so that's the times of the Gentiles we see that in history for Daniel Daniel it was all prophecy at the time he wrote it Nebuchadnezzar was the head Babylon was the head they had a goal the strongest empire there was even in comparison to the others that followed we've moved all the way down in in history We've seen all the way through Rome. What we have not seen is the revived Roman Empire, the ten toes that are going to make up that revived Roman Empire. We'll pick up next week, talk about when that happens, and we know when that's completed, the Gentile world rule will end. But for all those who have been taught that the Jews are ruling the world, the Jews own all the banks, the Jews have all the money, then I'll ask you, then why does God say this is the time of the Gentiles, and why do we not see the Jews up on the head nation of the world, if that be true? But that's the lie spoken so that they Satan can take that and say, so when you lose your house to the bank, it's the Jews' fault. When you see the, the world wars that, that were brought on, the Jews did it so that they get more pocket money because they were rolling the banks. And the nations had to borrow from them to be able to buy war implements. So the Jews got rich off of the war, da 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 da, and on goes the lie. Sadly, though, you speak a lie loud enough and long enough that people believe it. So my apologies for running over. I know I lost at least one that has to go in. Yeah, I'll pick back up with this. Um, I still think we'll go ahead and go on campus. I don't think they'll mind. I think it'll be a good lesson for them because we we just have a, too much to crunch into a few minutes. So um, I, I hope you don't feel like I got waylaid too much in this, but uh, I think it's very important to understand God has a wonderful plan. He has a plan for all of his humankind. He made the Gentile in his image, not just the Jew. And he didn't forget the Jew or turn away from the Jew. He loves equally, and he has an equal um, plan to bless. All the nations of the world were to be blessed through the seed, Yeshua, of Abraham. So, I, I hope you're catching it, realizing it. God's got a great plan for Israel. It is coming, but it doesn't mean that she's better than the others. It doesn't mean that she deserves it and the others deserve to go down. No, again, it's God's way of working, His order to show Him, to show who He is, and to show His faithfulness to His Word. If I didn't see His faithfulness to finish with Israel, and I've said it before, I'd shake in my boots for us today, because I see Laodicea all over. Yes, Philadelphia is there too, but I can say the same thing about Israel. There was a remnant that stayed faithful. But there was a lot that did not. And the same thing we're seeing in, in the church today. And I say to Laodicea, wake up. Or you may find yourself cut off and out and not in to receive the blessings. But um, thankfully, 
Our God is faithful. Our God keeps his word. And we'll look at what, how all of, of Israel will be saved. Because that's the verse we're coming up to. And that is a key verse. People take that out of context also. And they even say, you don't need a witness to the Jewish people because they're all going to be saved. So how do we answer that on the basis of um, Romans 11.26, which does say, and I'll read it for you, and this is my cliffhanger I'm leaving you on. Um, verse 26 says, and so all Israel will be saved. How do we answer that? What does that mean? If it doesn't mean that, well, then all the Jews have it in. They got it in because they're Jewish. Okay, I know you all know that's not true, but can you answer it? If you can, good. Come get short up even stronger, and if you can't answer it, hopefully next week I'll help you answer it. So, any comments, questions? Yes, Lita, unmute yourself. Lita, can you unmute? Okay, yeah. there you go. Uh, uh, are the Jews still called wild olive tree? Are you still? Uh, there's, the there's only one olive tree. That yes. olive tree is represented by Avraham, and it was a Jewish olive tree. The wild yes. that got grafted into the Jewish olive tree it's is the wild. Gentile. Okay, okay, I do get it now. Okay. Because it, it was mentioned wild olive tree. Oh, who is that? Yeah, that's... So now, yeah. Olive tree is the Jew, and wild olive tree are we, the Gentiles. Right, okay, thank right. You. But you're, right. You're, you're brought into that root, and yeah. you both yeah, benefited yeah, from you. it and became one. Mm -hmm. Amen. Thank you. Okay, you're welcome. You're welcome. Okay, let's go ahead and close... It. Oh, and go ahead, and then I'll close in prayer, and we can go on, but... Go ahead, Ed. Um, okay. Uh, in, in the end there, you referred to Daniel, what, 32 to 35? What chapter? Chapter 2. Uh, chapter 2. Chapter 2, 32 to 35, and then 44 and 45, same chapter. Okay. Yeah. And then I'm going to say 32 to 35. The main difference between uh, fullness and times. Fullness refers to more uh, specifically the belief of the people, and times refers more to the to the uh, perspective of the people, right? To, I didn't catch your end, but the times refers to the world role of the Gentile, actual okay. world world role, seen okay. in Babylon, Medo Persia, Greece, Rome, and a revived Roman Empire. World rule is the times of the Gentiles. They're allowed to rule the world through this time. Then okay. it will be the time for the, the Jewish nation to be the rule. Okay, and then the fullness is talking about a specific period of time. A, a specific period of time, and it's talking about the, the believing. The ones who come in to make up the fullness is the spiritual. It's the spiritual right. people. But there is a time limit on that. We do not know that time. The Lord alone knows when the fullness has come in. But when okay. it has, when that number is complete, that's okay. when it, that will end. And we know it ends in rapture. That doesn't mean that Gentiles don't get saved. It's the same way that Jews, you know, everybody still can get saved. But that they'll miss out on, on being up in the heavens with the Lord receiving reward while the earth is suffering the consequences of sin. Judgment of sin. The judgment of sin. Okay. Any other questions before we close in prayer? Okay. Then let's close real quickly. Oh, hey, Yisrael, God of Israel, we thank you that you love the Gentiles as much as you love the Jews. We thank you that you never excluded either, nor will you ever exclude either. The salvation is free to all who will come to believe. And Lord, how we thank you. It is by your grace that any of us are saved. It is not by our works. None of us have a right to boast. Let us realize fully the blessing of being brought in to the seed which is you. To receive blessing. To receive all the benefits that we do. To be your child and to have a heavenly home. It's because you did it all. 
and we receive it by faith because you give it in grace. Thank you, Lord. We praise you for your grace. We praise you for your mercy. We thank you forever and ever. In the holy name of Yeshua, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Amen.